this wonderful occasion of session number 3 of Srila Prabhupada's Maranotsav. So Maharaj, with your kind permission, is it okay if I take a minute or two to give a small introduction and then we can hand it over to you? Well, is your introduction going to be what is written on a website? You know? Yes, yes, Maharaj. The problem is that was written 20 years ago and it's a bit out of date. <laughs> okay. So, uh, nevertheless, Maharaj, uh, we have some personal, uh, uh, you know, touch as well. So, uh, are you okay if we uh, give that short introduction before we hand it over to you? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I think I, maybe I, I, we have to try to update these things sometimes. Yes, sure, Maharaj. So, with that, um, uh, we are once again, uh, we would like to welcome all the participants for this Srila Prabhupada's Maranatsa. Uh, it all began on 125th anniversary of Srila Prabhupada celebration, centenary celebrations, wherein more than 800 plus devotees all across India, across the world, uh, have joined and been reading Srila Prabhupada Lilamrit systematic study. And uh, this is like, you know, for last three sessions, Maranotsav is like a concluding ceremony with, you know, most illustrious senior most disciples of uh, His Divine Grace, Srila Prabhupada, are personally giving us, uh, you know, they are sharing their realizations about Prabhupada and we are most happy to, you know, receive them, these nectarine drops. So, uh, we started with uh, Girira, His Holiness Giriraj Swami Maharaj uh, in the first session and last week we've had uh, His Holiness Bhanu Swami Maharaj and today we are most fortunate to have His Holiness Swami Bhakti Vigna Vinash Narsimha Maharaj, a very, very senior disciple of Srila Prabhupada. He was initiated almost 50 years before, um, in 1971 at London from His Divine Grace Srila Prabhupada. And later he received second initiation as well. So more than um, probably four or five decades, he has been preaching all across the world especially in Asian countries like India, Philippines, China, Taiwan, Singapore, and so on and so forth. And throughout his, uh, you know, of these wonderful years of preaching, uh, there are exceptionally, you know, millions of souls getting guidance and deep inspiration about Krishna consciousness, about Srila Prabhupada. He also took formal initiation in 1994 from his Tamal uh, Krishna Goswami Maharaj. And um, Maharaj is very much known for his strict endeavors about his own sadhana standards and, you know, following of Krishna conscious principles. Whoever knows, uh, you know, Maharaj, uh, you know, they all respect about his sincere and faithful practice of Hare Krishna chanting. And especially, you know, uh, somebody who walks his talk. Uh, he has been serving and teaching in the Mayapur Institute since uh, its inceptions. And uh, personally, you know, uh, whenever I come across His Holiness uh, Maharaj's classes, it reminds me of the term Vajra Dabi Kathora Kusuma Dabi Komala. So while uh, Maharaj is on Vyasasan, his preaching of Krishna conscious principles are like thunderbolt, you know, killing all the misconceptions immediately. While in personal dealings, uh, he has been as soft as, you know, a tender as flower. And uh, personally, uh, Maharaj, I don't know whether you recall, uh, that was about, uh, uh, maybe about 15, uh, you know, 20 years back in 2000, uh, year 2000, uh, we had the great fortune that was before my marriage. My name is Anand Shesh Das. And just before our marriage, uh, my wife Sundari Devi Dasi, you had come to uh, visit uh, Iskon Pune Kunjavihari Mandir and in a chance meeting through our president, His, uh, His Grace Radhisham Prabhu, we could invite you to, we just gave you invitation uh, for our Vastu Shanti you know, uh, session and uh, to our great surprise, you agreed uh, you know, immediately without any prior connection. And we've had your holy presence throughout, you know, during that ceremony in our house. And uh, that was so touching. And, you know, personally, we were so inspired, you know, a senior most disciple of uh, His Divine Grace, Srila Prabhupada, gracing our house, you know, and giving us causeless mercy. So, Maharaj, we are very, very grateful for your time 
today uh, out of your busy schedule and once again we would like to extend a warm welcome and everybody on the call are so eager to hear from you about the nectarian flow of his divine grace shrila propa jagat guru shrila propa the ki chai so with that uh, we would like to hand over to you maharaj um, thank you so much hare krishna hare krishna thank you prabhu Oh, I see. So the program is, I, I will just talk, is it? There's no questions or anything. So Maharaj, if you like, uh, uh, the time, like uh, the schedule is, uh, you may speak, if you like, for an hour, maybe up to 9, 9, 10. And we also have some time for question answers. Oh. Uh, uh, devotees can put their questions on the chat box. I can, you know, um, uh, collaborate on that. Or maybe, you know, we can open it directly as well. So there is some time for question answers if you like, Maharaj. Okay. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I'll appreciate questions. All right. So I'll begin talking. Om Magyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksur Unmilitanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swamin Iti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Goravani Precharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deja Tarine Vancha Kaupata Rubyasya Kripa Sindhu Bhaivacha Patita Nam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnavi Bhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare So I joined the Krishna Consciousness Movement in the UK in the at the London Centre, at that time it was in number seven, Bury Place. Uh, I met the devotees actually through the books. I purchased a Krishna book, volume one. Volume two hadn't been published at that time. It was the only book which was really published. It had been printed in Japan by the generous donation of George Harrison. And so I, I'd, somehow I'd purchased a copy of that book and when I brought it home, showed my friend, he said, well, I have a book by the same person. And he pulled out a book, which was a smaller book. It was a book called The Topmost Yoga System. So we were very interested to see that, you know, this person has written these books. I purchased the Krishna book because I, I get, mainly I liked it. I liked very much the color pictures which were in the book. I, I was very attracted by the cover also. It's a very beautiful silver cover with the big picture of Radha and Krishna. So I, I really thought the book was very beautiful and I purchased the book and then it led to me reading this topmost yoga system. And after I read it, I was deeply impressed that this was a book which I felt I've actually understood. Because growing up in the 1960s, I was a, a spiritual seeker. It was a, at a time when life in India was a mystery and it, it appeared like everybody in India was a, a great yogi or something, you know. We had all these visions of what life in India must be like, and Ravi Shankar was playing the sitar, and we had the Beatles sitting with the Maharishi doing meditation, and we thought India must be like that, that everything, everybody's a, a yogi and a meditator, or a sitar player. So I'd gone after getting the book and reading Topmost Yoga System, then I started to go to the temple. And I ended, a short time later, I moved into the temple. I kept on my job. I had a job. I was working and I kept my job for some time. And uh, then they told me, they said, just give up that job, you know. <laughs> give up that job. You don't need a job. 
you work here, we need devotees here. At that time we were about 20 devotees in the London temple. All young men, there were two ladies. Uh, one lady was American and the other lady was French. Though not even a British lady. <laughs> but a lot of young British men. And I enjoyed the, the atmosphere. It was very energetic and enthused. And I, I was really attracted by the atmosphere. I used to go every evening to the RT and chant and dance. So I, I gave up my job, became full-time devotee, and uh, we were developing, trying to maintain the Krishna consciousness movement. And it was really a struggle in those days to maintain. We were renting a house, so there was rent to be paid. And then there was about 20 devotees, and we would have also Sunday program and regularly people coming by for, for prasadam. So it was not very easy for us to maintain the temple. We were struggling, and we didn't have a lot of books in those days either. As I said, we had the volume one Krishna book, which had come from Japan. So we had a few boxes of those. And then we had some Back to Godhead magazines, which had also been printed in Japan. So we had the Back to Godhead magazines. So I used to, when I was coming to the temple, there was this French lady, later on I found out her name was Mundakini, and she used to always say, Prabhupada's coming. And I said, Prabhupada? And she'd point to Prabhupada's picture on the wall in the temple room. I say, oh, yes, yeah, Prabhupada. He said, Prabhupada's coming very soon. And I say, oh, very good. And <laughs> it went on like that for several weeks. It became months, and still Prabhupada didn't come. But still Mundakini, she was always saying, Prabhupada's coming very soon. Prabhupada's coming soon. So we were always with that expectation that one day Prabhupada's going to come. They kept us alive. They thought that Prabhupada's coming soon. So it happened that we had the uh, Ratiatra festival there in London. We were already worshipping Radha and Krishna. The Radha Landanishwara deities had been installed by Srila Prabhupada. I was not there. I was not a devotee at that time. That was before my time. That was 1969, the deities were, in, deities were installed. I became a devotee in 1971. At that time, there were two, Brahmana, two Brahmanas only. One was Mundakini, and the other was a, a young man. He was actually Pakistan origin, but he was also Brahman. And so somehow Mundakini did most of the deity worship. As I remember, initially the deities, Radha Landanishwara, were changed only once a week. And Jagannath was changed once in a month. Because this was the very early days of our movement, very beginning. And this one, one girl, Mundakini, was doing everything herself, practically. So somehow the temple was going on, and eventually it happened. We had a Rathiatra festival, and Prabhupada did come. So when we heard that Prabhupada's coming, then we all went to the airport and Prabhupada came late in the night. For, he'd come on a flight from America and he arrived in London in the middle of the night. We were all there at the airport. Of course, in those days, the security in the airport was nothing like what it is today. And we could get quite quite well into the airport. We were, without any difficulty, we were all located there. And we were just waiting outside the immigration, just waiting for Prabhupada to come out of the immigration. And so finally Prabhupada came out of the immigration. And of course, as soon as Prabhupada came out, all we, we all hit the floor. Everyone just fell on the floor. Everyone just offered obeisances. And so Prabhupada came out and he saw everyone and it's the middle of the night 
And so then they simply took Prabhupada to the car and the, that was it. Prabhupada went off to the temple and we also made our way back to the temple. And we got back to the temple in Buri Place and Prabhupada had a room there. Now that room is interesting. It was on the, what we, what you would call in American or British languages, the, the first floor is up, one up from the ground anyway, above the ground. On the ground was the, the temple itself. You walked off the street and then there was a door and you were in the temple. And we would take Prasadam in the basement and Prabhupada's room was upstairs, directly above the temple. And there were three more floors where we had offices and the devotees lived. And eventually, you know, the number of devotees really increased a lot. You know, at one point we had about a hundred devotees living there in this building. It wasn't a very big building. Anyway, Prabhupada came there. We had this room for Prabhupada. And now what happened was that one devotee had come from America. His name was Keshava. He was the brother of Karandar Prabhu. Karandar was a very prominent devotee in Prabhupada's time. He was the president of the Los Angeles Temple and then he became like a GBC and a director of the BBT. He was a very, and he was, you can see also in Life from Life, he's there with dialogues with Prabhupada. And Prabhupada liked Karandar very much. So Karandar had one brother who was also a very nice devotee. His name was Keshava Prabhu. And he was a powerfully built young American man. And he came from San Francisco to help us to develop the Sankirtan. Because in those days, our movement was supported by Sankirtan. As I said, it was difficult to maintain the temple. We were renting the property. At the same time, we were worshipping deities. And we have many devotees to feed. So, how to get, how to maintain everything? Where does the money come from? So generally we, we would do Sankirtan. That was understood to be how temples flourish. If you had a good Sankirtan people, if you had good people on Sankirtan, they'd bring in a good income to maintain the temple. So it happened that we were not doing very well on Sankirtan in London. We were new to it and we hadn't really learned the art, how to do Sankirtan. So Prabhupada had arranged that one of the leading Sankirtan men would come from America to help us to organize it. So Keshava Prabhu came and he came and he saw our place in London and he saw Prabhupada's room and he said that, he said, you know, he said, this room, he said, and this, this building, he said, it's not really very good for Prabhupada. Although we did have one bathroom, which was for Prabhupada, we had Prabhupada's room, and it had a bathroom just beside it. But still, Keshava thought, he said, this is not really good enough for Prabhupada. We should be able to give Prabhupada something better, better accommodation. So he wrote to Prabhupada about it and he told Prabhupada, he said, you know, Prabhupada, he said, I think when you come to London, he said, we will put, we'll get you a, a nice hotel room. He said, because the temple is really small, we don't have a lot of room and that room of yours is not really very big and it's not so wonderful. So we thought we'd like to get you a hotel room. But Prabhupada wrote back to him and said, no, he said, I don't want to stay in a hotel. I want to stay in that room. He said, I like that room. And so that was really inspiring for all of us devotees, you know, because we were all living together, you know, really pretty cramped. I said, temple really blossomed. More and more people were joining up to 60, 80, even close to 100 devotees all in this building and not much facilities, but somehow we're all living together. And Prabhupada said also, he wants to live with us. So we, we, re we really ap appreciated that, that mood that Prabhupada had, that he 
wanted to stay with us in the temple. So anyway, Prabhupada came and uh, then we had initiations. We got initiated. Most of us were, nobody, I said there was only two devotees who had Brahman initiation and then I think only two others had been initiated by letter, um, Tribhu Vanatha Prabhu and Ranchar Prabhu, both both very wonderful devotees. They did a lot of service. Ranchar Prabhu is still with us and he's still active in Krishna consciousness and doing wonderful service. Tribhu Vanatha Prabhu departed from the world some years ago, but he also did a lot of service. So Prabhupada initiated all of us and I got initiation and there were several others actually. Mahavishnu, he got initiated, now Mahavishnu Swami. And Subhag had been a devotee for some time and he, he was supposed to get initiation by mail but he said, no, I want to wait till Prabhupada comes. I want to get the initiation directly from Prabhupada. So although Subhad Swami had joined quite a bit before me, he didn't take the initiation. He waited for Prabhupada to come because he wanted to get initiation directly. And so we were all initiated at the same time. Mahavishnu and Subhag and myself and about 15 others. Most, I think we were all men, very few ladies there at that time who got the initiation. But the interesting thing about it was, <laughs> you know, it's, it's only like years after when you, you reflect on these things, you start to remember what happened and you think, oh my goodness, you know. <laughs> that happened. Anyway, it happened. We got initiation, you know. Prabhupada wanted to see, you know, we were called forward, they'd say the name, back to Tom, back to Jim, back to John, you know, one by one, and come forward and you offer obeisances. And Prabhupada would say, say loud, loudly, I want to hear the Pranam Mantra. And, you, and we, you know, when you offer the obeisances, Prabhupada said, say out loud, what are you saying? He wanted to make sure at least we could say his Pranam Mantra. We didn't have a disciple course, but, you know, that was our test for initiation, if you like. Prabhupada never met us before. He never talked to us. We never had an interview or anything. He just, okay, who's, who's getting, who are the ones to be initiated? He accepted the, you know, whoever was the temple president, he would say, okay, you know, you will all get initiation. So we were told, you know, we can all go for initiation. And so we took the initiation. Of course, we were full-time devotees. We were living in the temple. We were kept very committed. And we'd been living in the temple, going on Sankirtan every day. And it's not like nowadays, you know, people live outside, congregation devotees. They come to the temple once a week for a few hours. You don't know what they do all week. Often they're just working in a job. But in those days, we were all living in the ashram and we were really committed to Krishna consciousness, living together, sharing everything. You know, whatever money we had, we gave everything we had. Whatever savings I had, I gave everything to the temple because the temple had no money. The temple was struggling every day. And so whatever, whatever money I had, I gave it to the temple. And, even when I quit my job also, I got some money, I, that all went to the temple. But the temp, the running, they didn't seem to worry about money somehow. Although we had no money, we, we didn't really worry about it. We just lived from day to day. And even for food, we would often go to the market and we would just beg in the, in the market. We'd go to the Covent Garden market and we'd beg boga. And Krishna would provide. And de serving the deities also to get flowers. You know, in countries like India, you can go around and pick flowers from a garden, and many trees with flowers. You can take flowers 
without difficulty. But in England you don't find that. You won't find flowers growing everywhere there in the UK. So we had to go to the market and get flowers and try to get some flowers, try to get some money to pay for the flowers and also ask if they can give some donations, <laughs> try to get them to give something for the temple. So anyway, we had the initiation and after the initiation, Prabhupada called the temple president to his room and he said to him, he said, you know, I gave all of these men initiation. He said, none of them gave me any money. None of them gave me any dakshi. <laughs> so the, the temple president, uh, it was a devote, a, an American devotee, his name was Dayananda Prabhu. Uh, Dayananda laughed to Prabhupada, he said, Prabhupada, they don't have any money. <laughs> They don't have any money. <laughs> and Prabhupada laughed. He thought it was funny how these young British people are there living in the temple and they have no money, nothing, you know, completely surrendered to Krishna. They've given everything to Krishna. And every day they just go on Sankirtan and they distribute Krishna consciousness. Anyway, that afternoon, after Prabhupada, but said that, that the next day we went out on Sankirtan and whatever collections we got from Sankirtan, then that was given to Prabhupada. So, I mean, that, that was the situation in those days. We were <laughs> just living like that in a very simple manner, very basic manner, very frugally, but very joyfully. And somehow, miraculously, more and more people were joining the Krishna Consciousness Movement. So, Prabhupada would come usually to England. He, liked, he would come in the summer. He knew England's very cold in the winter. He didn't like the cold weather. So he'd usually make a point to come in the summer. And the devotees would often invite him to come for the Rathiyatra. And sometimes it came also Janmastami. He'd be there. We had enough. Usually, when Prabhupada would come, the different places they may also invite Prabhupada to come, like Hindu temples or Hindu associations. They would invite Prabhupada to come to their place and give a talk. So we would go with Prabhupada. And there was one time also. Uh, it was a devotee named. Uh, I can't remember, what is it, Shirodakshayi Vishnu or Garbhodakshayi, I can't remember exactly, I think Shirodak. anyway, he was originally, he was Gupta and he was one of the very first Indian people to join Krishna consciousness there in the UK and he was a good man, he was initiated, maybe it was Karanadakshayi Vishnu or it was some, one, of the, one of those Purusha avatar names. And he had three sons. They were all young boys at the time when, when Prabhupada came. Now they're, they're, they've grown up and they're still around. They're still involved in Krishna consciousness. His sons are, they're, they're very nice people, very well educated, cultured. Anyway, this, this uh, Mr. Gupta, or he was initiated. His wife was Kirtida. She passed away very early on and her husband, he uh, had deities of Gornitai or was it Radha, maybe it was Radha and Krishna now. Anyway, he wanted, he said, I will arrange a Bhagavat Sapta for you Prabhupada. And he said, we'll do it in South Hall. Now South Hall is a region in England where there's a dominant presence of Indians, you know, Punjabi and a lot of Sikh and all kinds of Asian there in this area, South Hall, the very Asian area. So Prabhupada agreed that he would come for the Bhagavat Sapta and at the same time we would install the deities for Mr. Gupta, his, these deities of Radha and Krishna. So it was arranged, but, uh, they had this hall in South Hall 
and Prabhupada came all the way from London out to South Hall. It's quite a distance and drive through London and come to South Hall and have this program with these deities. And Prabhupada came and we did a little installation and Prabhupada gave a talk. And it was supposed to be Bhagwat Sapta. You know, he was supposed to come for seven days. <laughs> so after the first day, Prabhupada, he said, tomorrow night, Rebati Nandan Swami again. He said, tell Rebati Nandan Swami, you go. He said, that Prabhupada said, that hall was terrible. <laughs> Prabhupada didn't like the hall. It was, it, it was South Hall and it wasn't a very nice hall. So Prabhupada didn't go back again. He just went for the one night. It was supposed to be a Bhagavad Sapta. It told you something about what Prabhupada expected. You know, he, you know if you want Prabhupada to call Prabhupada to go to a program, you, he wants it, it should be, there should be some good attempt there made to attract the public and have a nice program. And we did do that. We had some, a number of programs, generally different regions of London. We'd arrange programs in the town halls, like Kensington Town Hall, I remember. We had a big program there. Not a lot of people would come. We'd, you know, we'd invite people, but not a lot of people would come. And sometimes even Christian hecklers would come. But Prabhupada didn't mind. He was happy to come. Nice hall, big hall, big auditorium, and Prabhupada would give a lecture. And he would also invite questions and so on. And he would, he would always be anxious to see what we were distributing for prasadam. And he would ask us, he would say, bring me a plate of prasadam, I want to see what you're distributing. I saw this with Prabhupada, not only in the UK, but in other places also. He was always very concerned that we would distribute nice prasadam, and that what we're giving to the public should be good. And he would taste it and see, say, all right, good. And even I remember, like in Calcutta, it's about 1976, I remember I was in Calcutta, and Prabhupada came to Cal Calcutta, and we had a program there in the Albert Road Centre, and there's a veranda there. The, so the program was not in the temple room. Prabhupada gave the lecture out on the veranda. And after the lecture, which Prabhupada had given in Bengali, native Bengali language, and then uh, Prabhupada made sure, he said, you must distribute prasada. And so somebody had to run off to a sweet shop and purchase sandesh and come back with the sandesh and distribute some sweets to everyone. So something must be there to distribute. You must give some kind of prasadam after, after the lecture. Prabhupada expected that. Uh, being with Prabhupada in London, we were young devotees. We didn't know much. Didn't know hardly anything really. So I just tried to hear Prabhupada. I was, it was enough for me just to be near Prabhupada and to hear what he was saying. I never really put questions to Prabhupada directly. One time we were wondering about reading books. Is it, is it enough? If we just read the book or do we have to read it out loud? Because hearing, the process is hearing. So do we have to, do we actually have to read aloud in order to hear? So I remember we asked, we asked Prabhupada that one evening and Prabhupada said, no, you can read, that's all right. So you don't have to read aloud. You can do it if you like, but you don't have to. So Prabhupada liked us to serve the deities nicely. He was very concerned that the deities were properly cared for. Uh, one time in the London temple in Bury Place, we had Radha Landanishwara 
as the main deity, but above Radha Langdaneshwar, there was Jagannath Baladev and Subhadra. The, the devotees had made a platform like above Radha and Krishna, and Jagannath Baladev and Subhadra were there on this platform above Radha Langdaneshwara. So we had a lot of flowers around Radha Langdaneshwara, but we'd neglected to put any flowers around Lord Jagannath. So when Prabhupada saw, he noticed and immediately said, why are there no flowers around Lord Jagannath? He said, you have so many flowers around Radha Landaneshwara. Why have you not put any flowers around the Jagannath deities? We'd given them garlands, but we'd, we hadn't yet put the vases on. Later on, we put the vases on. But Prabhupada was very observant about these kind of things. Another time also he observed we'd put the parampara pictures the wrong way. And Prabhupada noticed, this is wrong. Why, who's done this? This is not right. It shouldn't be like that. So parampara pictures also. Prabhupada would notice all of these things and he would be telling us, take care. He said, am I the only one to notice these things? So many of you are here, you should know. And we would go on morning walks with Prabhupada. Prabhupada, you know, he, doctor, his doctor had told him, you should go for morning walks, Swamiji, every day you need a walk. So Prabhupada would make a point to go every morning, usually after Mangalati, he would start out and go for a morning walk. And we would like to accompany Prabhupada. And on some of the walks, Prabhupada would be talking and he would ask, what is that sloka? What is it? Do you know that verse? <laughs> He'd be quite asking us to see, and do we know? So he expected us to know these things, to be able to quote slokas from the scriptures and to know these different verses. Prabhupada was very much concerned that we were being properly educated in the philosophy. I was a very new devotee. Uh, what happened was somehow some, some reporter had come from some magazine, an underground magazine there in London, and he'd come and he was just wandering around and he, somehow he talked to me and he talked to me and I was a new devotee so I didn't really know the philosophy well at all. And my mind was full of a lot of things because I'd been reading a lot of books by other gurus and Mayavadi philosophy and things like that. So somehow he talked to me and I spoke some garbage, some speculations to him, something about Krishna consciousness, which was not very accurate. So it happened later on, this reporter published the article and the article was read to Prabhupada and Prabhupada was upset. He said, this is not right. He said, this philosophy, he said, our men must learn the philosophy. He said, they must learn our philosophy properly and they must present it properly to the people. So that was instructive for us, that for me particularly, that we have to learn the philosophy. We have to read Prabhupada's books. We have to know what is actually, what is the Krishna conscious Siddhanta. It's important for us. Uh, so Prabhupada was concerned to see the devotees. He liked to see so many young people join Krishna consciousness movement. So many British people join the Krishna consciousness movement. That was very encouraging to Prabhupada. And it happened that he wanted to develop the India preaching so in the 1970s, it was very difficult for American people to come to India. The relationship between India and USA was not good. And somehow USA had lined up more with Pakistan. And so there was some tension there between the US and the India governments. So they were not giving visas for Americans to come to India. 
very difficult for them to get visas to come to India. But the British could come because at that time, British people, because India had been a British colony and there was an agreement there with India that British people could come, they didn't need a visa. They could come to India without a visa and stay as long as they liked. And so Prabhupada wanted the devotees to come from the UK to come to India to develop the India preaching because it was so difficult for the American devotees to get into India. And so that Prabhupada was happy. He said, send some men from England to India. He said, we need these, these young men, send them from England to come to India. So a number, a number of devotees did that. They, we were sent. And I, actually, I had, uh, although I joined in the UK, I had gone to the USA, and I was in USA for some time, and so it was uh, when Gopal Krishna Maharaj, he was coming to India, he, he was also a, a devotee in New York, and Prabhupada was sending him back to India to take up some managerial work in India. So he was told that you can have a couple of brahmacharis from the temple in New York, so I was one of the men he took because I was British, not because I'm a very good devotee or anything, but just because I was British and he said, you can stay a long time, you can get a visa, you don't need a visa, you can stay for a... So he brought me to India and that was 1975, I came to India. And so I'd seen Prabhupada in England, I saw Prabhupada in USA and I saw Prabhupada also in India. So I had that opportunity to see, seeing Prabhupada in these different environments and it was quite different and it was also different. Prabhupada was certainly different in these different places. So coming to India and Prabhupada was uh, concerned for the Indian preaching. He wanted to develop the centers there in India and he was very concerned to see that everything was done nicely. I noticed how Prabhupada, every time he would come, he would come to Calcutta Temple and then he would go out to Mayapur. And when he came to, De to Delhi, he, he would come to the Delhi Temple, then go to Vrindavan. He wouldn't just immediately go to Vrindavan. Although in Delhi, at that time, there was a very, just a very small center it was in Bengali market. We had a little rented house and we were worshipping Radha Partha Sarati. So Prabhupada would come there and, and he would meet the people. And I remember how Prabhupada was talking to the guests and he asked the one man, he said, what is your business? And the man said, oh, I have a transport company. He was one of our life members. So he said, I have a transport company, and Prabhupada looked, he said, oh, transport company, he said, you must have a car. He said, yes. He said, well, he said, Prabhupada said, I want, I want to go to Vrindavan, can you arrange a car for me to take me to Vrindavan? And so the man said, oh, yes, no problem. <laughs> so I was, I was impressed how Prabhupada was arranging everything himself, you know. Because we had no vehicle, we had, we had no car of our own there in the temple in those days. So Prabhupada personally arranged for this one man that he would arrange his car, his driver, take him to Vrindavan. And Prabhupada <laughs> was so uh, thoughtful, he knew how to do everything, how to take care of everything nicely. When he would come to Calcutta and go out to Mayapur, uh, he would always stop halfway, you know, he'd leave early in the morning, quite early in the morning, and he would stop halfway for breakfast. Because the roads were not really good, of course, it would take at least four hours or more, maybe five hours to get out there to Mayapur. So Prabhupada would stop halfway and there was a mango grove and Prabhupada would usually stop there and take breakfast there. So one year it happened, there was a big, un, a big envoy. There were many vehicles. Gargamuni 
had come with many vehicles from Germany. He brought a number of Benz vehicles and there was other devotees and there was a Chutananda and there were all Swamis at that time and they had many Brahmacharis also the Radha Dhamma, maybe some of the Radha Dhamma people were there and it's a big group of people and Prabhupada was there. We had a by this time we purchased an ambassador car for Prabhupada. Maybe you've seen that car. It, there were three cars purchased. There was one car in Calcutta, one car in Delhi, and one car in Mumbai. All ambassadors. In the 1970s, everybody had ambassadors. But it was very nice. They were nicely done. We had special seats put in for Prabhupada, and they put on a big chrome tea light right in the front of the ambassador, and it was maroon color. So it was nice. And uh, Prabhupada, that was Prabhupada's car. And all the other devotees were there. They had their vehicles. They all went together, a big fleet of vehicles. And they all stopped there at the mango grove. And Prabhupada was given his breakfast. Prabhupada was served first. And after Prabhupada had his breakfast, then all the senior sannyasis sat down and they took the prasadam. And then after all the sannyasis had their prasadam, then all of us brahmacharis, we were all given prasadam. And Prabhupada was happy. He was impressed. He said, he said, when the etiquette is followed so nicely, he said, then certainly Krishna is present. So Prabhupada was encouraging us the importance of the Vaishnava etiquette. And he said, you can feel the presence of of Krishna when you follow the etiquette. So Prabhupada of course would come out to Mayapur and then you'd like to go around. He'd, he'd check out the grounds and go everywhere and look at everything. What is this? Why is this like this? And <laughs> there was of course it wasn't a very big place at those times. There was not much there. There was only one building, the Lotus Building. And then later on, then they added that what is now the, what they call the Gada building. We used to call it the long building. <laughs> and and it, we had the wall as well. We built the wall and then they added some shop, uh, little uh, rooms on the side of the wall. Like that, we were living in Mayapur. Basic places, very simple places. But Prabhupada knew, he said, this is going to be the headquarters. He said, this is the headquarters of our movement. And he was telling people, every year you have to come for the meeting. We'll have a meeting, the leaders, you should come every year. And you should plan how you're going to spread Krishna consciousness in the next year. And Prabhupada also encouraged the Gaur Purnima festival. He liked that to see all the devotees come and would bring people to Mayapur. So Prabhupada liked to see people come to Mayapur. In Prabhupada's time, Mayapur was very different. It was a quiet place, very quiet. There was nothing much there. It's quite different now. But Prabhupada could understand definitely things that were going to develop. And he encouraged his Holiness Jaipataka Swami Maharaj, that he would develop Mayapur. And he would, he would uh, when Prabhupada would give a lecture, I remember he asked Jaipataka Swami to translate it to Bengali, to write it out in Bengali. And he would check it to see that he translated it nicely. So he, he wanted very much that Jaipataka Swami Maharaj would preach the Beng in the Bengali language, which he has done, of course very effectively. And Prabhupada encouraged the devotees everywhere that wherever you are, you should preach in the language of the people, the local language, that's important. You want to know the language. You have to preach in the language of the people. So he liked, uh, there was one devotee, Tejas, Tejas Prabhu, he was in Delhi. So he knew some Hindi. So Prabhupada encouraged him to stay in Delhi. 
In those days, it was very difficult to stay in Delhi. The climate in Delhi is quite severe. Very, very hot in the summer and very cold in the winter. And the preaching is also not very easy because it's not really... English is not very commonly spoken there in Delhi. It's much more Hindi. And without knowing Hindi, it's a bit difficult to do anything there. So the devotees, different, although Prabhupada would put different sannyasis there into Delhi, they wouldn't like to stay there. They found it difficult. The people not quite so willing and so receptive to Krishna consciousness. But Tejas somehow, he stayed there. So Prabhupada appreciated that one devotee could go and, and was willing to stay there. That's important. You go to a place, you have to be willing to stay there until, to, because it takes time for the preaching to develop. Just like there was one devotee in Hong Kong. So Hong Kong is another one of these places, you know, it's a very kind of passionate, a commercial enterprise, a lot of business there, and people are very much in the mode of passion. It's not an easy place to awaken them to spirituality. And again, English, you know, it's not really the local language there. Although Hong Kong was a British colony, the level of English wasn't very high. It, people were all speaking Cantonese which is a dialect of Chinese. And so people didn't like to stay there either. But Prabhupada wanted them to stay there. Prabhupada, there was one devotee there all on his own. He said, Prabhupada, I'm all alone here. I'm all alone here. I think I, I should just go. And Prabhupada said, no, just stay. He said, just stay and chant. I said, if you stay and chant, you will purify the place. He said, in the future, Krishna will send people. So, like this, Prabhupada was encouraging the devotees to develop these different places, which appeared to be, you know, far away and cut off, and we thought nothing's really going to happen here. But we see over the years, so many things have happened and so much preaching has come up. Just because devotees went and they were willing to stay because they stayed there and they stuck it out and so gradually it developed. So I think uh, Prabhupada will appreciate that, we will appreciate the efforts of these devotees. And Prabhupada himself was always concerned to try to encourage devotees who were in these different places. He made a point of coming to visit these different places and staying there. He wasn't thinking, oh, there's nowhere, there's nobody to initiate there. He wasn't thinking, oh, nobody's going to take very good care of me there. No, no, Prabhupada was just thinking that we need to preach here, we need to develop here. He wasn't thinking about his own comforts. He wasn't thinking about what facility or what they will offer him, but he was thinking about how we're going to establish Krishna consciousness. He wants to make some roots, to put some roots there for the Krishna consciousness movement so that it can develop. So Prabhupada had that mood to sacrifice himself, to make these efforts to sacrifice everything to establish the Krishna Consciousness Movement. Uh, Prabhupada came to London and he, 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 he also, he, they arranged a program for Prabhupada up in Scotland. He went up to Glasgow and he had a program in Glasgow. <laughs> so Prabhupada was willing to go to these places, you know. We didn't have money, we didn't have a lot, any big donations to give him or anything. We didn't have even nice facilities to offer him. But Prabhupada was just willing to understand. He knew that devotees are trying to preach in these places. We have to encourage them. I want to encourage them. 
And so he would go and visit these places, he would spend time there, give public programs. Even though he went, when he went to Glasgow, it was very cold there. It was very cold. The older body, you know, you're not, the cold climate is not so easy in the older body. So Prabhupada was, you know, mid-70s, 78, like that. And so coming up to these, these cold countries, difficult. But Prabhupada tolerated for Krishna. And we see Prabhupada also, how he went to, he went to Sweden and Germany, these countries also. Not very tropical <laughs> and pretty cold. But Prabhupada knew devotees are preaching there. We have to encourage the preaching. We want the preaching to go on nicely. And so Prabhupada would go on. He would see what are the devotees doing, what's happening. He would want to encourage the devotees. So these are some memories. Maybe we'll take some questions now. Hare Krishna, thank you. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Uh, such wonderful nectar of flow about Srila Prabhupada. In such short period of time, it was like, you know, going into the memory lane and uh, practically be there to witness Srila Prabhupada's divine pastimes. You know, just to quickly summarize, you began with such wonderful, you know, thought of uh, how Srila Prabhupada's grace you no, know, Mandakini Mataji practically single-handedly from 1969 running deity worship at Radha Landaneshwar. And that story of small room, you know, how Sri Prabhupada was so caring and loving to devotees. He didn't want to, you know, get rid of that small room even at the cost of his own convenience. And uh, we were so amazed, uh, Maharaj, with the dedication of all you, you know, disciples. Practically, Kaya, Vacha, Manasa, everything dedicated. And, you know, Srila Prabhupada's sense of humor about that Dakshina pastime. It was so amazing. And also about his care that every program should be followed with some prashadam. You know, that, was, that shows Prabhupada's unlimited care. And then uh, attention to details. Uh, you spoke about this wonderful stories of Srila Prabhupada, how he could observe... You know, there are no flowers. While Radha Randaneshwar were offered with flowers, Jagannath Baldev Subhadra had to be given with flowers. And, you know, uh, these were so beautiful uh, qualities of Srila Prabhupada about attention to details. And his concern about education, how his disciples should be very strict when it comes to knowing philosophy and systematically studying them. And then, you know, stories around the world, how his, you know, his emphasis on Vaishnava etiquettes, uh, which will bring Krishna together. And his thoughtfulness about, you know, preaching, utilizing everything in Krishna's service, about the story of, a, uh, you know, hiring, getting a car from a well-wisher, from traveling from Mayapur to Vrindavan. And his unlimited encouragement to his disciples to spread Krishna consciousness around the parts of the world in local languages. You know, he told about stories about Chepata Kamaraj being encouraged in translating in Bengali, and Tejas Prabhu's story in Delhi, and then Hong Kong, you know, preaching in Cantonese. And practically, Srila Prabhupada's grace took him to so many different places, you know, tolerating own inconveniences uh, uh, for the you know, cost of um, Sri Prabhupada's, you know, preaching. Scotland, Glasgow, my God, these, these places are unheard. But even at the right page, Prabhupada had that, you know, unlimited uh, mercy to spread Krishna consciousness and tolerate for the sake of Krishna. So Maharaj, I think this was amazing, enchanting and enthralling uh, times, you know, uh, taking us, all of us practically into those times. And uh, we really thank you from the core of our heart. Now we open up for questions. I think uh, there are a few devotees already raising hand. Uh, we would like to start with uh, Grace uh, Medhavini Sakhi Mataji. You would like to unmute yourself. So devotees can raise hands if they have questions and we can go one by one. Uh, Medhavani Mataji, Mataji, if you can unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you. Hare Krishna, Hare. am I audible, Maharaj? Yes. Hare Krishna. So uh, thank you so much, Maharaj. Uh, please accept my most respectful obeisances. Uh, thank you for accepting our invitation and sharing such uh, wonderful uh, Srila Prabhupada Katha. It's always wonderful to hear from you, Maharaj. Uh, you explained very beautifully how Srila Prabhupada tolerated everything and preached Krishna consciousness in all circumstances. 
So Maharaj, I had uh, two, three questions, but I'll ask one question and probably uh, in the round robin, if I get a chance, I'll ask my other two questions later. So my first question, Maharaj, is uh, 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 if I were to ask you, like, what are the three top qualities of Srila Prabhupada that attracted you to Srila Prabhupada and made you surrender your life to Srila Prabhupada and this ISKCON movement? Uh, what would those three qualities be? And if you can just share uh, some uh, pastimes around which Srila Prabhupada exhibited those qualities. Thank you, Maharaj. Not the easiest of questions to answer off the cuff. Anyway, <laughs> uh, uh, three qualities of Prabhupada. Uh, well, first of all, I appreciated that Prabhupada was a great scholar, that he really knew the topic, what he was talking, he knew what he was talking about, his presentation, right? So that's one thing. And then, uh, he, he, because he's talk, he, he wrote the books and he's lecturing on it. But then also, I appreciate also that he could present it in a manner in which we could understand it. You know, a lot of other people, they write books and, you know, it, other people, you, you can try to read their books and you just try to understand, what are they talking about? You know, what's it all about? It's not so clear, not always so easy to understand their message, but I thought Prabhupada's message was very, very clear, particularly in his lectures. I, he made his classes very easy for people to understand. You know, when he's writing the purports, sometimes the purports can be heavy, but when he was giving classes, he would always make the classes very clear and very uh, understandable. And so that was important for me. I also appreciated the fact that Prabhupada was a genuine renounced person, just the way he lived. As I said about him living with us in the temple, I gave the example how he wanted to live with us. And I saw him wearing his sannyasi robes all the time. And I saw him going, going for a walk every day. He liked to walk. Mm. He, his mode of what he would eat, he didn't eat opulent, very opulent or anything. He was, you know, natural, basic food. In the morning, he liked to have fruits, maybe a little cereal, depending on the weather colder weather, then you'd want something to heat the body. And lunch, he would have rice, dal, chapati, and samchi. I remember we were cooking in Bury Place and we, the Mataji made loki sabji. And Prabhupada liked it very much, you know, loki. He said, oh, this is very nice. He enjoyed it very much. And we would make the chapatis and we, you know, we'd cook one chapati at a time, and Prabhupada's two floors up. So as soon as the chapati came off the flame, run up the stairs, you know, and bring this hot chapati into Prabhupada's room, you know, to give Prabhupada the hot chapati. And, and Prabhupada would eat maybe, maybe three or maybe even four chapatis like that. And, so, and then in the evening, oh. Uh, Prabhupada was particular about the fruits, what fruits were offered to the deities. There's a pastime, maybe I'll just tell you the pastime is quite amusing. Uh, <laughs> it happened in Calcutta, in the Albert Road Temple. You know, we offered the fruit to the deities, and so Prabhupada said, bring me some fruit, I want to... And so Prabhupada, as I said, Prabhupada would like to see what are we offering to the deities. He was always concerned. So he said, bring me some fruit, let me see. He said, they just made the fruit offering to the deities, bring me some fruit. So they brought the fruit to Prabhupada and Prabhupada didn't like it at all. He said, this fruit, not very good. He said, who's bought this? Well, he didn't say it directly, but he said, who purchased this fruit? So then went message went, who purchased the fruit? And they said, oh, De Debu purchased the fruit. 
Debu, Debu was a, a Bengali man, not initiated of course, but he was a regular, coming to the temple regularly, and he was Bengali, and he was a little older than me, I guess. Uh, so he he purchased the fruit. So he said, bring him to me. <laughs> so he said, Prabhupada wants to see you, Debu. So he went in there and Prabhupada said to him, you're Bengali, you don't know how to purchase fruit? Mm -hmm. Bengali, Bengali boy, you don't know how to purchase fruit? What is this? This fruit is terrible. How you could purchase this fruit? I mean, it's not a joke, it's actually serious, you know. I mean, it shows how much concern Prabhupada had about the deities. <laughs> but <laughs> it, it, it was a bit nerve-wracking nerve for, for the Kerry Maharaj. Yeah, because nobody wanted to go and buy the fruit anymore. <laughs> That was the problem, and Debu said, I'm not going to go. <laughs> Nobody wanted to go and buy the fruit anymore because we thought Prabhupada may not like it. It was a bit scary. <laughs> but at the same time, instructive. You know, have to be very cautious of everything, what we're doing, what we're buying. So, so there's some things, how particular Prabhupada was, you know. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. So Thank I'll you, probably ask my questions in their own robin, yeah. If I get <laughs> a chance, you, I'll ask them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mataji, for bringing up this wonderful question. So, Saurabh Singhal Prabhu would like to go next. Hare Krishna Prabhuji, Sanvar. Shri Prabhu Bhakti Jai. Uh, Prabhuji, by, I have two questions. Uh, first question is, uh, uh, kindly share your photograph, uh, some favorite photograph with Prabhu Bhakti uh, if you have handy. And second, how did you come to know that Srila Prabhupada that this material world and what was your first reaction, Prabhupada? Hare Krishna. Well, I don't have any photo of me with Prabhupada. I don't have any photos. I don't know. Oh. That, there may be some photos. I don't have any. So I Hare. have nothing to share with you. And uh, I was with Prabhupada. I was with Prabhupada up, up, I was there in Vrindavan up to his, almost up to the departure. You have to understand that uh, in those days I was engaged with the Bhaktivedanta Book Trust and we were traveling in, around India and we were distributing sets of books. So we had a vehicle and I had a number of devotees also with me and we were traveling around India distributing books. So at one point, you know, we'd stop traveling and we'd come to India. We'd come to Vrindavan to be with Prabhupada. So we'd spend time with Prabhupada there. And we spent time, several, several days there in Vrindavan with Prabhupada. And, but I had a vehicle and I had these, these devotees also with me. So I, I had to make a decision what to do. You see, and so it wasn't, we, we didn't know exactly how long, you know, Prabhupada's going to be with us. And I personally, I didn't think Prabhupada was going to leave. I thought Prabhupada's going to be with us for a longer time, you know. So anyway, I made arrangements to go back to the van with the, and I brought the devotees with me. We went back to the vehicle. And just when I got back, then I got the news that Prabhupada left the body. So we immediately came back to Vrindavan. Actually, we had to come all the way from Gujarat. We came all the way back from Gujarat, back to Vrindavan again. We just come from Vrindavan. We went all the way back again because we wanted to be there. So that's what happened. I came, when we had Prabhupada left the body, then I could not believe it. It was, it broke my heart, and we we didn't sleep. The, we we did, we got the news in the evening. We stayed awake the whole night. We stayed awake the whole night chanting, and.
and then the next morning we got our tickets and we left to come back to Vrindavan. So, okay. Thank you, thank you so much, Maharaj. Um, so, uh, Medhavani Sakhi Mataji would like to go next again. And any devotees have any questions, they may kindly put on the chat box uh, on the, you know, looking at the time we have on. So, it's a request. Thank you. Thank you, Anandasi Prabhu, for the opportunity. Uh, Maharaj, uh, one more question what I had is, uh, you mentioned uh, you've uh, interacted with, seen uh, Prashila Prabhupada very closely uh, in the United States as well as in India, and you said it was different. So if you can just explain uh, how different, what was the, what was the difference in Srila Prabhupada's interaction uh, in the United States and in India? Well, well, I was never close with Prabhupada. I'm not one of those people, you know, I'm not like Giri Raj or Jaipataka Maharaj or any of these, you know, they're very prominent people. I'm not like that. I'm just a very ordinary devotee, you know, so I had no position. I, I didn't really have any interaction with Prabhupada, but my vision was that you know, Prabhupada in America, in the USA, in the West, then they were very careful to keep the devotees some distance away from Prabhupada. There wasn't much room for interaction there. Everything, everything was screened very carefully by the people who were managing and arranging everything, you know. People like Rameshwara and... Uh, Satsvarupa Maharaj and these people that, you know, they were maybe the ones organizing and arranging everything and they were very careful to not to let too many people disturb Prabhupada. That, you know, things in the West are quite different and, and they didn't want Prabhupada to have any disturbance and keep, give Prabhupada as much time as he could for himself and to do things which he wanted to do and to meet people who he wanted to meet. You know, some people who were doing special responsibilities, then Prabhupada would meet with them and he could instruct them. But generally Prabhupada would come, give lecture, and, and then go back to his room, you know. So in some ways it was the same, you know, it was the, Prabhupada had the same program, waking up in the night to translate, and have his massage also, even in New York, you know, I would see him in the garden in New York with a gumsha on, go out in the garden and have a sun bath and massage, you know, just like he was in India. But uh, still, because it's USA and because there's more young devotees and uh, a different atmosphere, so they were quite restrictive about who got near to Prabhupada. But in India it was more relaxed. It was quite a bit more relaxed that uh, the general mood there in India was a bit quite different. That you could, Prabhupada would give darshans in the afternoon and people could all go there and you, you could sit there and hear Prabhupada. So that, that was really the difference and Prabhupada was a bit more uh, at home in India, you know, coming to India, he understood he's more at home. So he had time to meet people and you got, he'd meet the life members and so on and he'd talk to them. You know, what business are you doing and so on, like that. You'd want to know. I was happy to meet the people in America. It wasn't quite like that. Oh, I've lost your voice, Madhiji. I can't hear anything. What happened? Yeah, Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Yes, yes, you're audible, man. Okay, so uh, Maharaj, actually, it is uh, it is quite different now, right? Nowadays, uh, you know, if we are abroad, out of India, we get more service opportunities to you know our spiritual master. In India, it is you know the service opportunities are much less because there are more devotees like that. So it's quite different now. So finally, one last question, Maharaj. Um, you mentioned uh, you know I've also seen it in Prabhupada's lectures. You know, Prabhupada addressing like rascals, this, that, and then uh, immediately after the class, uh, very lovely, loving interaction with the devotees. And uh, like uh, Anantha Shesh Prabhu very nicely introduced 
you know, thunderbolt preaching, which kills all misconceptions and uh, at the same time, very soft like a flower in dealing with the uh, devotees and dealing with everyone in that matter. Uh, so I've, uh, I've heard your nectar of instruction classes, Maharaj. I also felt that, you know, during the question answer session, you know, you were like a thunderbolt answering and, you know, clearing all misconceptions. And immediately after that, I've seen you in your relationships with devotees, very, very soft. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, how do you how do you maintain this balance, Maharaj? If I were to ask you, how do we develop this quality? Uh, can you give us some tips around it, Maharaj? Thank you. Hare Krishna. Well, I'm surprised to hear this. I certainly am not very conscious of this. It's not something I do consciously. Maybe just something happens, something comes up, which makes you feel very, you know, like a thunderbolt, you know, maybe some particular topic affects you and you feel really, uh, you know, the, have to talk about this, this is something really important. But generally, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm just not aware of it. It's just something which happens. I just go with the flow. If I'm relaxed, I, I prefer to be more relaxed and calm, <laughs> easy going. Yeah. So thank I, you, thank you, Maharaj. Yeah. Maharaj, there is uh, another question on the chat box. Uh, maybe I can um, pick up. Um, so you mentioned so many wonderful pastimes about different devotees being asked to preach in unfavorable situations, especially, you know, you mentioned about Tejas Prabhu, you know, uh, with so much unfavorable situation in Delhi, hot and cold weather. So how do we understand the uh, mood of spiritual master, you know, you know, uh, staying there consistently, chanting, even in such unfavorable situation, how do we continue? So how do we understand more, you know, our spiritual master? Just mood in those situations. Well, how do we understand the mood of the spiritual master? <laughs> well, spiritual master, we could say, well, he's a guru, right? He's a divine personality. <laughs> that he is a transcendental body. He's a spiritual body, so he's indifferent to all different conditions. <laughs> We could, you know, sometimes people argue like that, they think like that. that oh, the spiritual master, his body's spiritual, you know, so he, he does, it doesn't matter if it's hot or cold. Why does he need to wear a coat, you know, just because the weather's cold, you know, I mean, he's indifferent to the heat. Some people think like that. <laughs> but it's our duty as devotees that we should care about these conditions and just like for the deities, we do care about the deities. We give the deities winter clothing and summer clothing. You know, we could say, well, he's Krishna, this is a deity, you know, they don't know any difference between the heat and... But no, we, it's a question of our, our loving reciprocation with the deities, that we want to take care of the deities and show our love for the deities. And this is how we do it by making proper arrangements for them. Just like Lord Jagannath, the Lord Jagannath is sick and we're offering special beverages and different herbs and so on, med things to help to allow Lord Jagannath to recover his health so that he can come back and be there for Rathiyatra. And so the same way with the spiritual master, that while the spiritual master doesn't have a material body, but still it's our duty to think about caring for the spiritual master and to do, make arrangements for his well-being, for his wealth, to show our care. And Prabhupada did appreciate that kind of love when he saw devotees prepare things. I remember one devotee was telling how they'd made a, they'd made a hat for Prabhupada and then they made a bead bag for Prabhupada and they'd given Prabhupada a nice chadar and shawl. And so the devotee was describing how Prabhupada came down the stairs one morning and he was wearing all the different clothes which the devotees had given him. And he said, just see, my spiritual master has made me a beautiful jewel. And he said, now I will make all of you also beautiful jewels. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. That was so wonderful realization. 
and we can witness, you know, so many invaluable jewels Srila Prabhupada has, you know, created and they are present with us to share those uh, nectarine droplets. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Maharaj, one more uh, question coming from the audience. Um, especially in the situations where, you know, a devotee is put in uh, precarious conditions where he or she may not have a physical proximity with a spiritual master or for that matter a temple. So in such situation, um, you know, how do we go on, you know? I'm sure these situations have been there in several uh, Sri Lila Prabhupada's disciples, but still we see they carried on, you know, uh, taking the uh, wagon uh, you know, further and uh, taking the mission of Sri Lila Prabhupada uh, even in that uh, situation of separation. So can you throw some light on uh, this situation, Maharaj? Yes, uh, yeah, this is an, an important point. We want to understand how we can connect to our spiritual master without that physical proximity. It's not a matter of just being close to the spiritual master. But we have to understand the instructions of the spiritual master are not just only meant for one individual, but they can be applied to other people also. Just like Prabhupada told devotees how he wanted to develop farming communities. So somebody developed a farming, it's not their farming communities are limited to just New Vrindavan or Gita Nagari, which were maybe the, the farming communities in Prabhupada's time. But there's scope for other people to also develop more and more farming communities. And similarly, preaching to scientists, it's not that that works just meant for only the few people who Prabhupada spoke to about it. But anyone can take up these instructions that Prabhupada is instructing people, you know, we need to preach to the scientists, life comes from life, life doesn't come from matter, this is very important, we have to do this. So if someone's inspired to do that, then very good. If they're qualified, then go ahead and go into it and do it. It's not that you have to get the direct instruction from the spiritual teacher yourself, but you can understand the desire that Prabhupada wanted it. Just like Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati wanted people to go to the West and preach. It wasn't that the only person he instructed was Bhaktivedanta Swami, that you should go to the West and preach, but he instructed many people to go to the West and preach. But this is the point that uh, the instruction is there. You know, people, people just have to take it up. Who wants to take it up? Who wants to do it? We, we shouldn't think, oh, I, I didn't get any instruction. Just like I myself, I didn't get any instruction from Prabhupada directly. But other people got instructions, like Tamal Krishna Goswami got instructed about preaching in the Far East and China, developing the China preaching. So that opportunity is there. It's not just only for Tamal Krishna alone, but it's open for everyone, that others can also go there and also preach there. So we have to understand the, the desire of the spiritual master. And then you can take it up. It's not that you have to be directly instructed by him, or he has to come in my dream and tell me I have to do this. No, that's not required. You just read Prabhupada's books and think about the philosophy, hear Prabhupada's lectures, and you'll understand what does Prabhupada want you to do? What are you inspired to do for Prabhupada or for your spiritual master? Of course, your spiritual master is also a servant of Srila Prabhupada and he's serving Srila Prabhupada and you can also serve him, you can serve your, by serving your spiritual master, you can also serve Srila Prabhupada. It's not that they have to always directly tell you, you do this. You know, the intelligent person can understand what what should be done for the service of the spiritual master. 
it's not you have to wait to be told to do everything. So we have to think, we have to really pray to Krishna, how I can serve you, how I can please my spiritual master, what can I do? And then go out and do something. Don't just wait to, oh, you didn't tell me, oh, nobody told me to do it. You, you don't have to be told. If we're intelligent enough, we'll think about it. We want to do something. You don't have to be told. No, somebody's got to cook the offering. Oh, nobody told me to cook. Oh, the, nobody came to cook the offering. Somebody's got to do it. Go in there and cook. Don't wait for somebody to tell you to go and cook. You know, if nobody came to cook, then go and do something. Sometimes we have to do these things. Sometimes the pujari doesn't come. There's nobody to do arti. Oh my goodness, nobody's coming to do arti. All right, I better go and do it. Take, go in there and do it. Wake the deities and offer arti. Do what's got to be done. You don't have to wait for the instruction to be told. Just be a little intelligent and a little ready to serve. And then Krishna will give the opportunity. There's so much to be done for the service of Guru and Krishna. So don't just wait to be told everything. That's one thing. You want to be close to the spiritual master? We are close by service. I feel Prabhupada's presence by reading his books and by preaching, by taking up some preaching work on his behalf. I feel the presence of Prabhupada in these ways by being part of his society. And being part of his society means being actively engaged in some service. It's not just, oh, I'm initiated, I'm a member of ISKCON. But what are you doing for ISKCON? What service are you doing? So Prabhupada was, you know, he, he, he wanted to know, he wanted to know, what are we doing? What, and what results are you getting? So we have to think like that. How I can do something for the pleasure of my spiritual master, and for the pleasure of Krishna. And in this way, you can feel Prabhupada's presence. You can feel the presence of your guru. Prabhupada's two ways to associate with guru. One is Bhaivani, another is Vapu, right? So Vapu, physical presence, is not available, but Vani is always available. So think about the Vani, what is his instructions, and meditate on those instructions, and then decide which one you're going to really take up and go into. Some people want to distribute books, some people want to make devotees, some people want to worship the deities, some people want to take care of cows, some people are farmers. Everybody has their own particular ability, but that's all right. You can become perfect by any of these ways. It's not restricted, because all of these different services require devotion. It's all devotion to Krishna. And that's the important thing. Okay, Hare Krishna. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Maharaj, uh, for sharing this wonderful realization, pleasing spiritual master through service and thereby pleasing Krishna. So, Maharaj, on this day, you know, we also could witness some of it uh, through your divine money, how such wonderful illustrious disciples of Srila Prabhupada irrespective of their physical proximity or no, you know, they continue to uh, carry this torch of mission of Srila Prabhupada of spreading Krishna consciousness. And we pray to Lord Krishna that, you know, we get a speck of such unlimited enthusiasm uh, with, you know, uh, attentively hearing to your classes. So thank you once again on behalf of His Grace Madan Sundar Prabhu and entire Evolve community. And all the devotees on the call, we would like to express our heartfelt gratitude for such sharing such wonderful realizations, taking us back, practically back into memory lane, as if, you know, we were witnessing Srila Prabhupada's loving uh, divine interactions with all his wonderful disciples. So thank you for this enlivening session, uh, Maharaj. We would like to express our gratitude with uh, three times Haribol, Hari Bol, Hari Bol, Hari Bol. Hare Krishna.
इस वन में स्वामी भक्ति विघ्न विनाश नरसिंह महाराज की जाए इस डिवाइन ग्रेस जगत गुरु श्रील प्रभुपाद की जाए गौर भक्त वृंद की जाए हरे कृष्णा